and everything like that. And so we thank you so much for a great 2019. Looking forward to a great 2020. But hey, I wanted to end this week, this uh, year off with a bang. And uh, one of the greatest things about our church is that it's not about one person and one pastor. In fact, that's what I love about it, most about our church is that it's not about one personality and one voice into our, our culture, but it's multiple people speaking to our culture. And so we've identified about a few leaders in our church, about four of them, who, who are making a difference in our church and who are, who are trailblazers and they're making a difference in the kingdom of God. And they're going to come up and all four of them will, will be speaking today. It's going to be eight. They have each, each have eight minutes to give us a word of God and how God has overcome uh, on behalf of them. And I'm telling you what, it's going to be amazing. And so, hey, I, I need y'all to do me a favor. When you get up here, it gets intimidating. Like, because some of you just stare at people like this. It's scary, the lights and all this stuff. It gets scary up here. So could we treat them like they're TDJ, y'all? Come on. Come on. Can we shout them down? Awesome. And so we have four amazing communicators. I'm going to introduce them to you, and uh, they're going to come up uh, just in order. I'm not going to come up in between them. We have uh, Paul Henderson. We have Sarah Freshly. We have Jessica Stanley, as I talked about earlier, and then we have Aaron back, and they're all going to come and bring the word of God today. So I want to pray over this time. I want to pray, and then, uh, man, we're going to invite our, t- uh, our team to come up, and they're going to they're gonna give us God's word for the next few moments. So, God, I pray that you may speak right to us. God, I pray that you may do what you always do. And, God, you always take your word, divide it a few different times so that we can hear your word so clearly, God. Lord, we didn't, we didn't gather here together, Lord, and get a, check our kids into kids' ministry. Get ready. Drive. M- many people drove far away to get here today, God. I pray, God, that we didn't come to hear from us, but, God, we came here to hear from you. So, God, we pray that you may bypass our thoughts, our limited experience, our limited wisdom, so that you can speak right to your people, God. We are vessels today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord some praise. Let's give him praise in this place. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 I like Travis said, I'm Paul. I'm Paul Henderson. Um, if I haven't had an opportunity to meet you, I'm Paul. I'm, 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 I'm pleasure to serve here. I'm honored to serve here. I'm married to my beautiful wife, who I affectionately call my curly haired righteous fox. Woo, see, that's a good looking woman right there, I tell you. I tell you, I tell you, I tell you. And then we, we, have our, we have our boys. Our, we have three amazing boys. We have PJ. We have Joey. We have David. And we have boy number four on the way. Yeah. Somebody say, yeah, boy. So, so let me tell you about children. So this is what children do, right? They keep you humble. So last night, you know, my two-year-old, he's crying and crying and crying. And I'm like, I could either let him cry and just let him stay in his bed, you know, give him some milk, you know, th- things you do for a two-year-old. But I'm like, I'm trying to get some sleep, right? Now, a little bit about me for those that don't know, I'm not the most touchy person, okay? I have a capacity, right? It's been growing a little bit since I've been married and have children, right? Okay? So I bring David in the bed, and he just snuggles up, and he spoons me all night. It was weird. It was really weird. But you know what? I love my boys, and I wouldn't have it any other way. And I'm, and I'm so thankful for, for God and what he's done. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you all back a few years of my life when I was running track and field. You probably can't tell now, but I was a runner back in the day. I really was. Cheeseburgers have tried to defeat that, but I'm still a runner. I'm still a runner. Okay, so, so here, here's what happened. About 15, 16 years ago, I was running down in Suffolk at Nansen River High School, and I actually had surgery. I had surgery, and I was out for two months. Now, know, you know if you're out for two months, you can't run, you can't condition, you can't do the things that, that you typically would do. So when I came back, I wanted to get in shape, but my boys, they had been running for two months without me. So I'm working, and I'm working, and I'm working to get back in shape, right? And my coach, he saw something. See, my coach, he's about five, 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 six. He little pigeon toes, so he would look at you, and he would say, I tell you what, I tell you what, we got a chance this year. We got a chance this year. And Travis, I tell you what, he looked at me, and he said, but Paul, you are the weakest link. Oh, I ain't like that too much, y'all. I did not like that too much because what he didn't understand was that I dealt with failure in my life. And today what I want to talk about is how God overcomes failure. If we could uh, pull up the the verse, right, Um, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. 
It says, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Or as I would like to say, for I am God's masterpiece. He has created me anew in Christ Jesus so that I can do the good things he planned for me long ago. So let's fast forward a couple, a couple of years later. I'm running track at VCU. And I had a friend at the time, you know, a friend at the time. I'll just say that, okay? We had gotten into an argument right before track practice. And so I'm running to the track, and I'm running to the track, and I hear this voice. Because once again, I'm, I'm dealing with failure. I'm dealing with disappointment. So anytime I would deal with failure or disappointment, it would either lead me to a very dark place, or it would lead me just to rage and anger. So I would either be depressed, or I would be really angry. So I heard this voice as I'm running to the track to Sportsbacker Stadium. And this voice said, Paul, you can end it right now. There was a tractor trailer coming directly towards me. And it said, go out and run, run in front of this truck, and I guarantee people will care about you now. I said every single verse that I could think of. Every single verse that I could think of, I just said it, and I began to claim God's word. And for the next few months, it was a constant battle. I had a couple of suicide attempts. But God delivered me. Because he knew that he had a plan for my life. He knew that he had a plan for my life. But here's the deal. We have to know whose report do you believe? So you see, I was hearing this voice saying that, Paul, you are a failure. But his word told me that I'm his masterpiece. So am I a failure or am I his masterpiece? Now, let's look at God's word. See, I love Peter's one of my favorite guys in the Bible. The, uh, the disciple Peter, the apostle Peter. And I love it because he has some really high moments, right? But then he had some really low moments. You know, one of his high moments was when Jesus called him out and he walked in the water. You know, he took his eyes off Jesus and then, you know, then Jesus helped him back up. But the thing I like about him, he was the only one that actually got off the boat. His faith was there. Uh, there, was there. But then I look at another, another one, which I want to focus on. Jesus said, who do people say that I am? And people said, oh, they say, they say you're Jeremiah. Or they say you're the prophet of Elijah. Or, or you're John the Baptist. Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? And Jesus said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, Peter, that didn't just come from you. God gave that to you. He said, Peter, your name means rock. And that, what you just said right there, that, that's the foundation on which I'm going to build my church, a very high moment. But then a couple of minutes later, you look at Peter. When Jesus has been arrested, they said, hey, you were with Jesus. And he said, no, no, I wasn't. They said, no, you were with him. They said, he said, no, no, that wasn't me. They said, you walk like him, you talk like him, you dress like him. You were with Jesus. And then he cussed me, swore that his best friend, the person he had been traveling with, eating with, sleeping, anything that friends do that travel together for three years, he was with them. And he flat out denied him. Flat out denied him. So Peter had a, he had a choice to make because he was down. And he was, he was convicted. He was condemned. But Peter chose to allow himself to be encouraged because when Jesus resurrected himself, he said, Peter, do you love me? I can imagine how Peter was feeling. Convicted. God, I let you down. I failed you. I failed you, Lord. But yes, I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. And he asked him two, two or three more times. And Jesus said, Peter, just feed my lamb, feed my sheep. Don't allow that failure to define you, because I still have a purpose. I still have a plan for your life. A few months later, we see Peter preaching one of the very first sermons in leading over 3,000 people to Christ. He went from being a failure to saying, you know what, God, you still have a plan for my life, and I'm going to walk out that plan that you have for my life. So Motivation Church. My question for you is this, when we fail, when we mess up, when we drop the ball, when, when we mess up in our marriage, when we mess up as, as a father, as a mother, when we mess up on our jobs, do we believe the report that we're a failure or do we say, no, God, you have a plan for my life and I'm purpose in my mind, I purpose in my heart that I will walk out the plan that you have for my life. I just want to encourage you today, as Sarah's about to come up. Whose report do you believe? 
Believe the report of the Lord. Allow him to encourage you through his word. His word is a, is, is a lamp unto your feet, a light unto your path. Allow him to encourage you through prayer. Allow him to speak to you. But one thing, and I'm going to pass from this era. Peter wasn't by himself. He had people around him. And he allowed the community to keep him lifted, to keep him lifted, to keep him lifted. So don't isolate yourself. God has a plan for each and every one of our lives. And our desire to see you walk it out. Amen. Amen. Am I on? There we go. Can we give it up for Paul one more time? That was awesome. Woo. I am, my name is Sarah, and I have the honor of sharing with you guys this morning. Um, when Pastor Travis had texted me, and he was like, hey, like, would you like to share at church next Sunday? And, and my first initial reaction was, I was like, no way. No, I'm not doing this. <laughs> um, so I do want to share with you guys this morning about overcoming fear. And there's times in your life where you might be afraid to do something. You might be afraid to get up here and talk in front of a group of people. You might be afraid of failure, like Paul said. Or you might just be afraid of what other people think. And I am standing here on this stage as a testimony that God does not want us to fear. Amen. God desires for us not to be afraid. He says that 365 times in his word, do not be afraid. He says in, on 2 Timothy first, or verse 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 7, we've got it up on the screen here. It says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. What an amazing verse that is. I've had that verse plastered all over my house because, honestly, I've struggled with caring way too much about what other people think. It's funny when looking back at middle school and high school and some of the decisions I made, some of the um, people, most of the people that I hung out with, a lot of the decisions I made was just to, to get their approval. It was because I, I cared too much what I wore. I cared too much how I, how I carried myself. And honestly, that brought a lot of pain, a lot of shame, guilt, regret. And the reason why I want to stand up here and share this message with you guys is because God does not want us to be afraid. He doesn't. Most importantly, I didn't know what it meant to be secure in who I was. And, most, and more importantly, whose I was. A child of God. Overcoming fear isn't an overnight process. It was, it was time and time again of just asking God, why do I care so much what people think? And it, it certainly, it was just a, um, a process of pursuing God on a much deeper, deeper level and meditating on his word and verses like 2 Timothy 1.7. I was full. Let me back up. So when I took a step back, I really just... Uh, I had to come to a realization of God's love for me. And it's not that you hear it growing up. You hear, Jesus loves me, this I know. God loves you, man. God loves you, girl. And it's like you, don't, you have to step into this realm of knowing that um, it's unconditional love. It means that there's nothing I could do to make God love me more. And there's nothing that I could do to make God love me less. It's not conditional. It's unconditional. It's an agape love. Next, I had to take a step back and examine where my identity was. Was it in what people thought of me? Was it in where I worked, the sports I played? It certainly wasn't in what God said about me. I was full of fear. I was full of doubt. I was full of insecurities and worry about the opinions of others. And so what did I do? I, I put verses all over my house. I, I put, um, you know, God's promises John 1, 12, I am God's child. Romans 8, 1 and 2, I am free from condemnation. Yeah. Ephesians 2, 6, I am seated with Christ in the heavenly realm. And I, I left it on my seat, but I've, it's a pretty raggedy old piece of paper that I've had up in my shower for the past couple of months where, you know, when I'm getting ready in the morning, I'm just like, these are the promises that I need to focus on and that I need to believe in. That, that unchanging word, those unchanging promises in God's word, that is what I had to focus on and not what other people thought of me. And most importantly, and the key to overcoming fear is you have to trust God. You got to trust God like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego trusted God when in the fiery furnace. Like Esther coming before the king unannounced. That was the death sentence back in the day. 
And God said, you have to do it. You were made for such a time as this. And we can't forget David slaying Goliath. Like, that right there, I, I would have been shaking in my boots like, I can't do this. <laughs> but God. <laughs> Man, even in the darkest times, we can trust God to make things right. This trust comes from knowing God and knowing that he is good. Once you learn how to put your trust in God, we no longer are afraid because God's got our back. You know, one day I will stand before my Heavenly Father and I have to give an account of what I did in this life. And I don't want to stand before him and say, oh, I could have, would have, should have if I wasn't afraid. You know, Jesus died for us so that we can be in relationship with our Heavenly Father. And I don't want to, I don't want to stand before him and say, you know, I, I was afraid. And we, we, we can be in relationship with a God who desires for us to trust him because he knows the plans he has for us, plans of hope, plans for a future that is prosperous. So now I know I can stand boldly with confidence and know, and I can go before his throne and know that I was not afraid and that I did not let fear hold me back because I know every bit of me was like, I don't want to do this today. <laughs> But I know that someone needs to hear this message that you can overcome fear. I want to sum things up. So God is he's very clear about not being afraid. And he knows we'll, fear the, the, we'll feel the fear. But we have the option whether or not we want to walk out in fear or if we want to have, if we, we, we can choose to have faith like David did to kill Goliath. Most importantly, God loves you. And I don't have this in my notes, but when we were worshiping, um, God kind of laid it on my heart to share with you all. Probably um, back in the summertime, I just remember I was worshiping. I remember just asking God, why? Why do I care so much? Why would people think of me? And um, he just put this vision in my heart, and I walked into this big throne room. It's this old style, like old throne room. And I could I could make out a figure on the throne, but it, it, it was, uh, I, I, there was no face. And then it was, it was bright. And I looked to the left and I saw Jesus. And I was dressed in all different colors, like a nice, beautiful gown. I'm walking towards the throne. And I see Jesus and he meets me. And he says, my beautiful bride, you look amazing. Are you ready to meet your father? And I felt so much shame and guilt, and Jesus just turned me around, and my dress went from color all to white, to white as snow. And I just remember feeling whole and pure and knowing that I was secure, and I was significant, and I was loved by Jesus. And I pray, and I pray that you guys can approach the throne and know that God has got your back. He's got your back, and he loves you so much. And because of Jesus, we can do that. So I pray this word encourages you this morning that you can overcome fear. I'm so excited to hear from Jessica. She's got an awesome word for you guys this morning. Let's give it up one more time for Jessica. Amen. That was a great story, overcoming fear. That's also a testimony of mine because anybody who's close to me knows that uh, speaking publicly is not my thing. <laughs> I can sing in front of you all day, but you ask me to speak and I'm, mm -mm, no. Um, but uh, as Travis touched on earlier, my name is Jessica Stanley. I was uh, diagnosed with stage four breast cancer in July of this year. Uh, whenever I speak that out loud, uh, these tears aren't tears of sadness. They're tears of joy. Because by all accounts, I shouldn't be standing up here today. But because of God's grace and because I stayed firm in my faith, I'm able to testify. And the most important part of my story is I'm not even fully healed yet. But I'm believing for it. I'm walking in it. I don't allow the diagnosis to deter me from living life. And so the point of 
my sermon today is that God overcomes the diagnosis. Whether it's you, whether it's someone in your family, someone you're close to, um, it doesn't matter what the doctors say because every time I go to an appointment, they, they, they remind me, oh, you know, we're just trying to maintain you. This isn't a curative process, but I know the God that I serve. My son, Elijah, five years old, he will remind me on a daily basis. Um, his interpretation of, of the um, scripture is, Mommy, there's nothing too hard for the Lord can't do. <laughs> <laughs> and even at his young age, he understands the power of the God we serve, that we serve a way maker, a promise keeper. You know, those songs we sing on Sunday, they aren't just words. There are true testimonies for each and every one of us. Um, and I'm just grateful that I'm even here today to share with you all. I was scared out of my mind too, Sarah. Travis texted me at the last moment and said, hey, can you do this? And I was like, <laughs> I was going to act like I didn't even see the text. But <laughs> turn read receipt off. But, uh, <laughs> but I knew that. Uh, what I was going through is, is much greater than me. Um, there's somebody who is, who is witnessing my walk, and their faith may be on the fence. And so I made a choice after the initial fear, after the initial doubt and worry about what this disease was going to do to my body. I made a choice to walk fearlessly in my belief that God's going to heal me. There's a scripture that says, rejoice in your suffering, for a suffering brings perseverance, perseverance, character, character brings hope. And my mother, she has scriptures all around the house. I had to move in with them after the initial diagnosis because I was literally debilitated. I couldn't, I couldn't walk. I could barely speak because the cancer had spread to my lungs. Um, I could barely feed myself. She had to bathe me, help me get dressed to go to appointments. And so uh, when I say these tears are tears of joy, I literally have seen the worst of this disease try to take me out, but I'm here. <laughs> there were days when I would look up to the side and say, God, you know what, take me now. <laughs> Swing your sweet chariot low and take me now because this is just too much. And it's okay to have those days. We're human. We're supposed to feel things. But something I also know is that you can't stay in that place. We serve a God who's going to see us through He's going to carry us through to the end, no matter what, whether it's disease, whether it's just a, a regular illness, whatever it could be that's affecting you on a physical um, standpoint. Don't be afraid to walk freely in your life. Don't let that disease take over you. I could have laid in my bed and just, and just given up because there were days when I felt like doing so. For the first time in my life, I experienced depression because I didn't know what to expect. I had never felt the type of physical pain that I felt uh, after my diagnosis. It seemed like as soon as they told me what it was, things went left. <laughs> and it took me by surprise. But I'm thankful for this church family. I'm thankful for my immediate family, my mother, my father, my son, my brothers, because they are, are encouraging me to keep moving, keep pushing, and I know that I have a team of prayer warriors on my side. So even in my weaker days, I know that I have a strong foundation who's, who's working on my behalf. And so again, I say God can overcome the diagnosis. It doesn't matter what they say to you. You just walk forward. You stay firm in your belief, and God will see you through. All right? Amen. I'm going to welcome up Aaron. <laughs> That's good. So I've got this one. So good. Such a good word. Can we give it up one more time here?
<laughs> wow, they would put me last after that. That's good. Thanks. I appreciate that, everybody. What is he going to say? Hey, Jesus, the overcomer. Jesus, the overcomer. We've already heard Jesus, the overcomer of the voice in your head that tells you your worth. Jesus, the overcomer of your fear. Jesus, the overcomer of the diagnosis. Hey, my name is Aaron Back. I want to come to you today and speak with you a little bit about Jesus being that overcomer. I can, t- can I tell you two stories, two quick stories here? The uh, first one was Christmas Eve 2017. Christmas Eve 2017. I was on a stage. I was preaching uh, a Christmas Eve service at a church. And I was right in my groove. You know what I'm talking about, Travis? Like right there, like, oh, I've got it. And my look out back, and at the back doors of this uh, church, my wife has my son. He's completely pale. He's two months old. And he, you can see his chest heaving from the front. I'm just <sighs> panting like a dog. And she's waving bye to me like she's out. And I'm, <laughs> I'm up in front of everybody. I completely forgot everything. Inert sermon notes, gone, all of it. I'm like, we're going to go ahead and pray now, everybody. And I'm calling uh, uh, elders up to be like, hey, you've got this service. I got to go. And my son uh, had RSV, respiratory virus, uh, that, uh, that shut down his lungs. And he went into a coma on Christmas Day, 2017, two months old. I got to take a moment out now. I'm not a crier. I don't cry. I've cried probably two times in my life, and this is one of them. Uh, my wife is probably upset that I never cried at our wedding. It's just, I was just happy, but this one, it was so heavy. And I remember him going into that coma for almost 14 days. He was in a coma. And I remember praying again and again. And we have some misconceptions, but we all kind of have them as Christians, that there's some sort of correlation between Jesus and Easy Street that there's some sort of correlation between our faith and that it's just all going to come together, right? So I'm sitting in this, I'm sitting in this like waiting room area. I come in, I go out, I'm moving all over the places I can. You think you're doing something, you're really just pacing. And I remember thinking that there was something that I should have done. There was something I could have done. There was some prayer that I should have prayed harder. There was something that should have been done here. And it reminded me of a story in John chapter 11, probably my favorite narrative in the Bible. It's the story of Lazarus. In John chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus tells Martha this. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this up here, but I'm going to give you a little bit of the story for those of you who don't know. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. And Martha and Mary... And Lazarus are very good friends of Jesus, some of his best friends. He calls Lazarus one of his greatest friends again and again in Scripture. And Lazarus is very sick, sick. Lazarus is very sick, and Jesus is called to help him. And Jesus says, no, we're going to wait here for a time. And his friends are, like, confused at this. Because you know what they knew? They knew Jesus the healer. They knew him. They knew his name. I knew Jesus, the healer. I knew Jesus, the provider. And I'm sitting in this hospital going, all right, Jesus, the provider, where are you? Jesus, the provider, this is, this is your moment. Jesus, the protector, this is your moment. I've seen you do it. And in 2019, you probably known Jesus by some names. You've probably known Jesus, the protector. Maybe you've known Jesus, the healer. Maybe you've known Jesus, the provider, but in 2020, Jesus is going to come to you and say, I am the resurrection and the life. So you've already come to me thinking what I am, saying who I am, and I'm not Jesus, the healer in this situation. Aaron, it's greater that this can happen today. And I'm sitting in a hospital room, I'm bawling, and all I hear is it's greater that this will happen today. And I'm going, there's no way. This is my boy. This is my two months. I've only known him for two months, man. Don't take him from me. Come on. But he said, greater that it will happen today because you already knew me as your protector, and now I'm going to be your healer. I'm going to be your resurrection and your life, Aaron. And when he woke up, and he did wake up, it was, it was terrifying and adorable at the same time. He had an intubator in. He's, like, sucking on the intubator. And it's, I remember it was the funniest and most terrifying moment of my entire life, but he woke up. And Jesus comes to Lazarus at the tomb. Lazarus has been dead many days. And he says, Lazarus, come out. And some of us, you've seen probably like the movies where Jesus walked into the tomb and he like breathes on him and all those. Those are really cool moments. But really, Jesus didn't go in there. He's back here and he says, come on out. 
and Lazarus had to come out. Now, some of us, it's a real dramatic moment. He was wrapped up, so it was probably more like, <laughs> as he comes out of this tomb. And Jesus says, hey, go to him and unwrap him. Let him go about his way. And this tells me three things in my situation. If I give you three points today about Jesus become, coming from being Jesus the healer to Jesus my overcomer. Jesus, my resurrection in my life is that it's this. One, it has to be him who does it. He says it. Lazarus didn't pull himself out of that tomb. He said, hey, get up. He said, Aaron, you know what? This situation is terrible, but I'm the overcomer. I'm the resurrection. I'm the healer in this moment. It's got to be me. But here's another thing that I see is after he does it, Lazarus has to walk out of the tomb. So some of us in 2019, we've heard God say who he is. We've heard him say, come out, but it's time to step out of a tomb today. It's time to move from death to life. It's time to move to resurrection life. I want you to look around the room for point three because here's the great one. Jesus did so many miracles where he spits in blood and he lays his hand, he touched people. I mean, there were miracles where he didn't even realize someone touched him and they're healed just by that touch. Jesus didn't touch Lazarus. And it was so confusing to me at first, but then I see the example he gives. He looks at everybody else and says, hey, guys, help him get untied. What are you doing? Hey, you, go, go help him get unbound. Because here's what's great is there are people in our lives that are in this room that God has called them out in 2020. He said, hey, I'm going to be your resurrection. I'm going to be your life. And they're stepping out of the tomb, and it's you and I's responsibility to help take the grave off them. Take the grave off them because we're going to work together in this. So Motivation Church for 2019 to 2020, I want you to ask yourself this question. Jesus says, I am the resurrection of life. He ends it, and he says, do you believe this, Martha? Do, do, you, do you believe it? Because I'm going to go over here. I'm going to say it, but I need you to believe it. Because what I didn't realize about this story is what Jesus was doing to Lazarus. He was doing to Martha at the exact same time. Like, he thinks, oh, you think we're just raising Lazarus? No, I need you to believe it because I'm calling Martha. Do you believe it? Are you coming out of the tomb today? So here's the question for you. Here's what I leave you with. I'm going to turn it over to Travis. We're going to take a moment. Don't let this moment pass you by, though. Don't let it pass you by. What do you, we've already asked, who do you say I am? Overcoming the voices, overcoming the fear, overcoming the diagnosis. Jesus had a name for you in 2019. What's his name in 2020? What's his name? And don't let it be bound by what you remember in the past. Let it be bound by who he says he is. Jesus, the overcomer today, wants to overcome every situation. Can you bow your heads with me real quick? Father God, as we come into your presence, we've heard so many good words today. We've heard so many things that you've said, Lord God, through your people. And we are so grateful that you are our overcomer of the voices that say that we could end it all now. We're not good enough. We're failure. You are the overcomer that you are the overcomer of fear in our lives in Jesus' name, that you are overcomer of the diagnosis, even if we're not living in it now, we know you can do it in Jesus' name. And Father God, we know that you are the resurrection and the life, that you overcome the burden, that you overcome the pain, Lord God. So Father, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ over each person here that you would reveal yourself in a new way to them this year that you would reveal your voice, you would reveal a name to them in Jesus' name. That, Father, when we believe that all hope is lost, that Jesus, the overcomer, the overcomer, would say, come forth, and we would step out of the tomb. Father, we love you. We praise you. We give you all the glory in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Come on, one more hand clap for all of our speakers today.